We'll start out um, with the first one um, by Mary on environmental justice and the SDGs from synergies to gaps and outright contradictions. Thank you. <coughs> um, great, thanks. thanks again for having me. Um, some of you may have seen me speaking yesterday. Apologies for hogging the stage. Um, so I'm going to talk about whether or not the uh, in SDGs are really adequately encompassing environmental justice issues and addressing the impacts of reaching the SDGs on potential implications for my environmental justice. Um, this is a paper co-authored by some of uh, some people who are uh, here today, including Leah, who just spoke, and and Mariana and others. Um, and I'm at the Sussex Sustainability Research Program that looks at interactions between SDGs. So that's sort of the framing of why, why we're doing this work. Um, I assume everybody knows what the SDGs are, but just in case. <laughs> um, so there are 17 different goals that have been put forth, um, progressing from the Millennium Goals, now calling them the Sustainable Development Goals for the agenda um, 2030, transforming our world. So the intention is, can we bring uh, the world towards a better place through the use of these goals? Um, but it is not a simple, obviously we know it's not a simple task. Um, there are 17 goals which are overreaching, which sound very good. <laughs> They're noble aims, end hunger, end poverty, avoid climate change and all of those great things. However, within that, there are 160 targets and 230 indicators that are being used to, to assess whether or not countries are reaching those targets. Um, so we start to unpack some of these indicators um, and targets to understand how, what are the implications for environmental justice and whether or not environmental justice issues are even being taken into consideration. Um, so justice more broadly within the framing of the SDGs is addressed to a certain extent in the uh, document Transforming Our World. They do talk about equity and inequality and access quite a lot, which addresses issues about distributive justice. And there is mentions towards procedural justice in terms of participation of, of people in that process. Some nods to questions of rights in terms of a human rights framework. Um, but really, justice is treated, in term, terminology-wise, um, in terms of legal justice and access to, to right to, to rule, of, rule of law. Um, one of the SDGs, 16, speaks explicitly about justice, and that's justice sorry, and strong institutions. Um, and a group of us are, have put together a chapter for um, an if Euphro book about the SDGs and forests, uh, specifically addressing SDG 16. And what we found, again, SDG 16 is focusing almost explicitly, almost exclusively on rule of law. There's only one mention of human rights in one of the indicators. And there's a broad focus on transparency and accountability and state-based definitions of justice that are really privileging what the state wants and what certain actors want and not taking into account recognition of other forms of interpretations of justice and what people are looking for. So even within looking at the SDG that addresses justice, issues are not holistically um, addressed in terms of environmental justice. So this is, all of this work is coming from a paper that we have currently under review, which hopefully will come out soon, um, where we started to look at these gaps and synergies and, and contradictions. And so if we step back and look at the food, water, and health nexus uh, in terms of what, what were the implications for environmental justice, it, there is a clear um, assertion of the right to clean water, health, and education within the SDGs, but there is no recognition of a right to food and, and nutrition because it is assumed that the markets are going to solve that problem. Um, 
obviously this is problematic and it's not solved it for a very long time, so how can we expect the markets to solve food insecurity in the near future? Um, there is also the focus of the um, SDG 2, which is the end hunger, on increasing productivity, which one of them explicitly recognizes the need for equitable access to land, which again reflects back onto distributive justice, but it fails to account for power relations um, and the structures that are really excluding poor people from benefiting from increasing productivity. And also it focuses on increasing productivity over the larger agro-industrial complex and doesn't mention the importance of local people and other poor farmers benefiting from that increase. There is one, one mention within, within this of fair and equitable sharing of benefits uh, from the utilization of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge. So at least we have one nod to recognition of, of local knowledge um, and traditional knowledge within this packet of SDGs, but again, broadly focusing on distributive justice and ignoring other angles of justice. Um, energy and climate, again, there is an explicit uh, recognition of the overlap between climate and energy, and um, that they're necessary conditions to achieve social justice and the other SDGs, but again, a focus on distributive as aspects of justice. Um, and a failure really to think about, and also thinking about corrective justice within the climate change uh, SDG, think, talking about transfers of money and assistance to uh, lower income countries, which is a form of corrective justice, but it ignores the background of injustices that have led to the current situation as it stands. Um, and the climate change adaptation SDGs tend to focus on questions of adapting to floods and storms and other state priorities instead of the needs of the poor. And one thing that was just mentioned earlier, earlier today, if we focus on renewable energies, this is going to lead to an increase in the demand for mining, which has environmental justice implications on the ground for communities around areas where mining is, is happening. So again, this is quite a... <laughs> You know, it's such a complex web in terms of you poke the nest one place, it leads to many implications elsewhere. So we're starting to unpack that. And this is just some highlights because I can't go through everything. Um, the conservation SDGs, which you'd expect to address environmental justice, again, recognize issues of distributive justice. But there's no guidance on other aspects of environmental justice. Um, target 14.5 talks about protecting 10% of coastal and marine areas. Target 15.7, urgent action on wildlife poaching and trafficking. And as I think many of us in the room know, in many cases, these sorts of goals have in the past and continue to lead to things like fortress conservation, exclusion of local peoples from parklands, and green militarization where we're giving park guards arms to try to combat poaching, which is leading to extensive violence in, in the field. Um, poverty and inequality, which are an, um, ending poverty SDG 1 and uh, inequality SDG 10, it is recognizing the need to end poverty in all its manifestations, yet focuses again on income. Um, and this failure to address the link between poverty and resources and environmental degradation and the structural factors that create poverty. And also that the inequality um, SDG 10 focuses on e inequality between countries but not on accumulation of wealth by elites nor other indicators um, of well-being within, within countries. So yes, we're focusing on distribu distribution across countries but not within countries. Um, and I think the elephant in the room for, for many of us is SDG 8, which focuses on economic um, growth and we, the attempt to sustain per capita economic growth. Um, and this is framed as being possible by, by re uh, increasing efficiency in consumption and production, but to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation. Um, this hasn't happened in the past. Is this going to happen in the next 20, 12 years, or now 11 years, as we get to 2030? Unlikely. And so there's really no sign that this has happened in the past, or is there's many actual explicit efforts to make this happen within the SDGs. So there's a lot of concern. I think 
broadly, but amongst our group when we were looking at this, this is an outright contradiction. If we're going to focus the SDGs on economic growth, this is in contradiction of achieving environmental justice at a global scale. Um, and to give one kind of grounding this a little bit in, in what's happening in some countries, um, part of our larger project is looking at questions of extractives in, in Ecuador um, and looking at global commodity chains and what are the implications for SDGs at the local level. Um, Ecuador is pushing for mining framed as sustainable development and growth. But if you look at the distribution impacts, local communities are, are affected by the costs in terms of water pollution, land degradation, etc. while the benefits in terms of economic growth and consumption accrue elsewhere. Um, procedurally, the decision making is happening top down. Um, free prior informed consent is not being implemented, at, implemented adequately, and actually there's been a lot of court cases within Peru, um, Peru, not Peru, <laughs> Ecuador recently that use the failure to apply FPIC as a reason to stop particular mining projects that are being proposed. Um, and recognition, again, there is a failure to recognize indigenous people's ways of life and other forms of um, development or well-being that people might want to push for. And again, another, just a quick example from the Intag Valley history of copper mining. Again, if we push for renewable energy, we're going to increase the need for copper mines. And this is an area that has led to extensive conflicts, violence against local communities by the police and paramilitaries. Um, and so we see these conflicts brewing, and as we push for improvements in one SDG, we, meet, we may be leading to environmental justice impacts that we don't expect. Um, so, summarizing, I'm, yeah, I think I went a little faster than I expected, go me. Um, <laughs> Key points, uh, yeah, so again, many of the SDGs and the broader framework for, for the SDGs focus almost exclusively on distributive aspects of justice. And there's a failure to pay attention to and give any guidance on other aspects of environmental justice. Um, and while we feel that we do recognize that some of the SDGs and the targets will improve outcomes for environmental justice, Broadly, it, there is no incorporation of environmental justice frameworks within the SDGs. And one thing that we're starting to look at as a project and with Ecuador as a case study um, is that the SDG indicators you need to report at the national level. But this fails to account for the impacts on local people. So if you are looking at national level increases in uh, in income or, or, or whatever it might be, you fail to capture what is happening on the ground. And so one of the things that we're doing is looking at working with local projects and local communities, say, what would you measure to say whether or not the target for that particular SDG has actually been achieved for you? And, that, and that's not happening enough yet. And again, the elephant in the room, in the room of focusing on economic growth is really quite problematic. We're not stepping back and thinking about actual sustainable development instead of sustainable growth. Um, thank you. That was more of a, again, just a, a bit of a, a summary. Okay, thank you. So we'll move right on, um, and we'll go through all the four presentations first, and then have time at the end um, for questions and discussions. So next up is myself, um, Heike Schroeder. I'm going to be talking about indigenous mobilizations and sustainable development. Okay, and um, so my talk is based on um, preliminary um, findings from a research project um, that started in September last year and is going on for two and a half years um, called Indigenous um, International Interactions on Sustainable Development, INDUS, and this is our, our lovely logo. And um, co-authors include all the, the members um, of our research project um, here as well. <laughs> 
start working. Yeah, but it should. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, as a starting point for the presentation, but also our research project, um, we have a, a moment in time where we have the Agenda 2030. We just heard a lot about it. And there is this one little principle that stands out to me um, from it, and it is about leaving no one behind. Um, if we are to be serious about leaving no one behind, I think we do have a lot of work to do before 2030 to make um, that happen. And we have heard some of the dynamics actually to tackle with just um, in the presentation before. We also have Agenda 21, which has been around for a little longer. And it specifically declares um, that sustainable development activities should aim towards achieving a better understanding of indigenous people's knowledge and management experience related to the environment and applying this to contemporary development challenges. And then thirdly, um, we're in a, in a very interesting phase in the international negotiations in the cl climate change forum where um, indigenous peoples have negotiated now successfully um, um, with um, country delegates an indigenous people's platform. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. But it is quite unique because it really brings indigenous peoples to the table. Um, in, and, and the aim specifically is to catalyze learning, engagement, and policy coordination that benefits local communities and indigenous peoples, as well as the international community. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So now where are we? What is the reality? Um, so we are seeing, I think, this is really, really visible, um, a greater kind of an emergence and growth of mobilization on the part of indigenous peoples and their causes in a, a number of different policy realms. I think particularly strikingly so also in the UNFCCC. For example, at um, the 2015 COP, um, 21, where the Paris Agreement was adopted, there were a whole, uh, um, about a thousand, over a thousand indigenous representatives. Now that is quite a lot because they do travel from you know far distances most of the time. Um, they still only represent about three percent of total participants at that conference. Now the question is, to what extent are they just being seen? And here's you know a nice picture of the colors that are on display oftentimes in these international meeting, meetings nowadays, um, through their outfits, their dance, and showing off of themselves. Um, and to what extent are they being heard? Um, and also making change, making influencing the, um, the proceedings. Of course, there's good reason why we are hearing more about indigenous peoples, why they are um, much more visible these days. And these, here are a few, a few little data points. Um, so there are about 5% of, of, of the world's population that would self-proclaim um, themselves as indigenous. And this is only kind of a smaller grouping within a larger grouping of local communities that to some extent at least have, are dependent on forest resources. And that would be about 17% of the global population. Um, indigenous peoples manage about 11% of the world's forest lands. Um, they, they customarily own, occupy, or use something um, somewhere between 22 and 65% of the world's land surface. Um, and indigenous lands and other protected areas have created, are created to safeguard land rights, indigenous livelihoods, biodiversity, and other values are estimated to contain about 312 billion tons of carbon. So that is not insignificant. Now, despite... Um, all this, of course, we all know how vulnerable a situation um, indigenous peoples are in, in terms of, um, on the one hand, they, they contribute very little to the problem, um, they, they lead very low carbon um, ways of life, um, but their ecosystems, the ecosystems they live in, they depend on, are of course very vulnerable to changes, um, 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 changes in, in, in climate conditions. Um, they are also very heavily dependent on resources from the forests. Um, and also, um, many, many indigenous peoples are seen as the most marginalized and poorest um, globally. And then there is an additional 
challenge, an additional kind of area of vulnerability, which is that they are oftentimes at the mercy of outcomes of international efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So this is indeed a very kind of dynamic and challenging area. In the project, um, the, in this project, we are looking at three different countries. Um, Bolivia, Uganda, and Papua New Guinea. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about two of them because uh, we may not have that much time to do all of them. Um, and, and then I'm going to talk a little bit also about the international negotiations on climate change. So first of Bolivia. We chose Bolivia because it is an interesting country in that it is one of the most advanced countries in terms of modern legal frameworks for protecting indigenous people's rights. Um, and so it is a plurinational nation state as of 2009, and it thereby grants con the country's 33 indigenous nations the right to their autonomy, their own form of development, territory, intercultural education, and free prior and informed consent. Um, it has also kind of led to there now being what they call communal territories of origins, or TCOs, and they make up about 20% of the country's territory, um, and they, they kind of have important implications for the management of common property resources um, because they provide additional legal frameworks for, these, for local control and property rights um, to be enacted. However, despite that having been established, the subsoil still, of course, um, is, is property of the Bolivian state. But they recognize the communal lands, traditional territories of indigenous people, indigenous nations, um, and as independent entities for the first time. So therefore, quite significant. We looked um, and we went to one area um, called Lomerio. It is um, an area kind of in the eastern lowlands um, of Bolivia, in the department of Santa Cruz, an area of about 260 hectares, and it is managed through one of these TCOs and by the Moncox Indigenous Peoples, um, and that has been so t since 2006. So they have actually been um, one of the first to fight for their rights of, um, to a territorial autonomy. And in Lemerio, there is an indigenous, indigenous organization called SICOL that is um, administering um, the territory. Um, and it is made up of local chiefs, and they call them caciques. Um, so what is still striking here, and this is a lot of what the contentions are around, is that although we are dealing with a territory um, that has an indigenous organization, see called that, that is administering kind of the communal land rights, there is still also a municipal government in place that is part of the kind of state system um, and thereby recognizes other kinds of, 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 of legislation than, um, than uh, Lemuria itself. And the interesting thing is also that they are the same people. So just to show you a few pictures of, of how this then um, plays out. So on the right, on the left side, you see um, a landmine, a, 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 a small communal mine um, that is mined um, by anybody who um, so wishes to go and do a little bit of digging um, using only tools, um, no machinery, no chemical input. Um, and of course, the, the revenue will not be very high. Um, but it is uh, one of these contentions around whether or not it stays this way, and it is something for communal um, you know, engagement, if, if they so wish, or whether it should be explored um, further um, in order to um, increase the revenue from it. On the lower right side, you see a map that was drawn by the, the, the community members we were working with um, that are part of the indigenous organization SICOL, who um, were making sense of their land. So they're drawing, drawing maps of their land, identifying important um, places um, for them, and telling us stories about the meaning of, of, of those places for them. Um, just as an example, and, and I think they, they very nicely demonstrated the challenges um, that they're facing with and, 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 and where you know, the, the real vulnerabilities lie for them. For example, um, they showed us a river that had been running dry because of climate change. So because of the 
drier river, um, they don't have the ability to fish anymore. So there's very little in, in the way of fish um, that would otherwise be part of their diet um, that is now missing. Okay, so then to move on um, to the next example, um, Papua New Guinea is a very different example in a way because it is a country that, although it has gives customary um, rights to um, of, um, to most to indigenous peoples, um, it doesn't have as much of a kind of institutional framework setting behind it. So PNG, for example, has not ratified UN DRIPS or ILO um, 169. Um, on the other hand, it has huge reserves of minerals, of um, gold, silver, nickel, um, <clears throat> but it also has it, it, its environmental kind of ex exploration extraction is very unregulated. Um, and, and there are no kind of schemes, uh, there's nothing, no provisions, no, no um, systems that allow, that, that support indigenous peoples from, or local peoples from gaining any, any benefits. So we went to an area in the western province of, of Papua New Guinea, Tabuville, which um, is probably is known for its big mine, the Octagi mine, which is one of the biggest copper and gold mines in the world. And it has been um, in operation since 1984. Um, and it has actually led to a lot of devastation, environmental degradation in the area. Um, there, there is an ethnic group in the area, the Min people they call themselves, um, who um, are kind of on one hand attracted to the potential um, benefits um, deriving from having a, a, a mine, but at the, uh, on the other hand are also experiencing the environmental degradation and also the kind of marginalization um, as a result of, of the mining in the area. So a few pictures on the on the left on on the no on the right you see um, the old Octedi River also dried up um, the area has also experienced a lot of environmental kind of changes um, there have been several droughts recently that have actually closed the mine down for a few years it's back it's open again it demonstrates how vulnerable. Um, um, to climate change the area is in all its regards. So if there's no mine, there isn't the revenue that helps some of them at least. Um, if there is um, also, you know, shortage of water that affects uh, the, the, the livelihood support um, practices that exist. Then quickly moving on, um, the UNFCCC is an area where I think there has been an interesting shift in the, in the way that indigenous peoples have been recognized. There may be kind of changes of, of norms occurring because for the first time, and I'll, start, I'll show you the, these pictures, on the left-hand side, this is a meeting that was um, co-chaired by a, um, a party member and an indigenous people's representative, so an observer organization member. And this is the first time ever that a formal meeting took place that was co-chaired with a non-party uh, representative. Um, and it was one of the meetings that constituted then the indigenous people's platform. Um, but I think um, the point that, that I think is really the contention in the room is very nicely summarized by this quote. Um, sometimes it's difficult to speak the colonists' language. This is a challenge because of how you interpret concepts, how you interpret words or worldviews. We're getting better and better at this because we don't want to be on the outside of the game. And so this leads me very nicely to concluding these three cases, kind of preliminary early insights, um, showing how they are at very different stages and facing, um, despite despite, well, facing different um, roadblocks, challenges, but also being set very differently institutionally. <laughs> um, so Papua New Guinea is, I think, the example where there's really no legal context. There is um, very little in, in the way of regulation and protection. So these people actually operate in a, in a context without even NGOs present, um, a, a, any kind of international um, assistance and they're really on their own trying to learn from past 
failures, past mistakes of not you know, negotiating well with miners um, to, to then you know, have at least some benefit from um, the mine, mines being there. And I can go into much greater detail um, if you are interested in, uh, ab about these dynamics. And then Bolivia is actually you know, as good as it gets in a way um, institutionally with the frameworks that exist. However, there are still a lot of challenges on the ground for, uh, in terms of implementing the regulations and, and the protective frameworks that exist. And then third, the UNFCCC, I think, is maybe the, the most uh, positive of, of cases where you really do see a lot of shifts and, and a lot of increases of soft power, at least on the part of indigenous peoples, where they're, they're at least kind of, in terms of numbers, much more visible. Um, and there are, you know, slowly, slowly shifts in, in the ways in which um, their, their voices are heard. And again, I can go into much greater detail. Thank you. Um. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I'm I'm Stefan, one of three co-authors um, of this paper. We are trying to get our heads around um, um, an empirical apparent um, problem of climate justice that is becoming apparent outside the realm of global climate governance. Um, disciplinarily speaking, I'm an international relations person. My colleague Clara has some background in political theory. And uh, Uli Foltz uh, is uh, the economist on the team. And uh, as we develop this paper, um, we very much draw on an empirical, economic, rather sophisticated modeling study that Uli was involved in. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as I move on. Um, yeah, and that, that uh, empirical vantage point that got us going and said, well, this is really a case to be considered in the context of climate justice is, um, is uh, a study that has been uh, commissioned by the UN Environment Program and um, Imperial College Business School and uh, SOAS, where uh, Uli is also a fellow. Um, have been involved and uh, they assessed uh, systematically through econometric analysis the uh, relationship between climate vulnerability and sovereign credit profiles and the cost of capital in developing countries and um, uh, on, the, uh, on the assumption that climate risks are multi-dimensional, they cover a wide range of uh, geophysical, social and economic issues that need to be considered. And the observation is that the intensification of these risks and uh, the degree to which they are accurately priced or not accurately priced by financial markets have become an increasing concern for global economic stability. So climate risks also as a threat for the global economy and for global financial stability. Um, Empirically, if one focuses on uh, um, climate vulnerable developing, developing countries as they are organized in the, in the V20 or the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which uh, at the time of the study had 48 members, uh, it becomes very clear that this constitutes uh, a case for climate injustice and therefore for climate justice research. And I quickly summarize um, the... Um, some of the, of the core findings from, from that uh, study of uh, Uli and his uh, colleagues. Um, when they were looking at the sovereign borrowing costs, which is the technical term for what we refer to as, or, um, as cost of capital in the context of this study, is that assessments of climate risks within the global financial system have led to increasing costs of capital for climate vulnerable developing countries. And in particular, this spells out uh, on the basis of this econometric, econometric modeling uh, that I would not be able to explain in detail, but that I found compellingly argued and presented by my economic uh, colleagues, is that for every $10 paid in interest by climate vulnerable developing countries, uh, by now already an additional dollar is spent due to the climate vulnerability that they are facing. Um, 40 uh, climate vulnerable developing countries that have been part of the analysis have, uh, in, in the period between 2007 and 2016, paid 
already 40 billion more, 40 billion additional in interest payments uh, on their government debt alone. And if one also considers uh, private external debt, that number rises to 62 billion. And that's for a 10 year period only. And uh, the economic modeling estimates that uh, over the next decade, uh, due to further climate risk assessments, etc., this uh, should raise to 146 or 168 billion approximately. This is depicted uh, here. And uh, obviously this uh, study, uh, if you're interested in the details and the modeling that underpins it, is available uh, online uh, free of charge. So um, I think it's rather obvious that we have a strong manifestation of climate injustice uh, um, here, um, as documented by, by the study. And uh, that's because the countries that have contributed little to nothing to anthropogenic climate change are hit uh, double by its consequences, uh, not only uh, through the physical damage to, uh, that the climate risks uh, impose on their economies and societies, but also because of the climate risk premium that is charged uh, to them at ca on capital markets increases their cost of capital. While the global financial system braces itself against climate risk at the cost uh, of those who are already disproportionately at risk from these very risks that they have not, um, that they have not triggered themselves. So if one would apply uh, the polluter pays principle, um, as many of us have referred to already during the course of this conference, uh, we could uh, clearly argue that the polluter pays idea is put upside down. And uh, we have instead a, a vicious circle that is uh, somewhat driven by actors within uh, the global financial systems, including private actors like rating agencies, um, through root causes that actually lie outside the global financial system, that's the climate risks, and that are supposed to be addressed by global climate governance, which again is uh, um, uh, in turn is disconnected to um, global financial governance because the sort of the, the institution uh, to deal with, uh, with climate risks and with climate cha change is the, uh, is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement, etc. So we, we have a, a structural disconnect, as I would argue. Um, <coughs> And what we are wondering is how can we apply reasonably a climate justice lens to, to deal with, that, with this issue. And um, we're aware that there's a much broader climate justice, environmental justice literature out there, but to have to, to get a start, to get our heads around it, we refer to the um, sort of di dichotomy introduced by Simon Caney uh, that distinguishes between burden sharing approaches and harm avoidance approaches. And the burden sharing approaches um, in the in the case of the of this cost of capital debate um, seem to be a, um, a bit off target. I mean, as I have already uh, elaborated, the polluter pays principle is obviously violated um, by the empiric incident. Um, the ability to pay is would be rather hard to apply in, in view of the um, conditions of climate vulnerable developing countries uh, who invariably are um, on the on the on the poorer end of um, human development indices or whatever you apply and um, um, with the beneficiaries pay approach you the starting question would be uh, what benefit are we talking about? So um, by, even by exclusion, a harm avoidance approach would appear more suitable, but, uh, and there are several reasons for it. I mean, the harm avoidance approach basically focuses on the entitlements or the, on sustaining entitlements of victims or potential victims um, of, of um, climate change and, uh, and attributes rep responsibility to others in order to help them sustain their entitlements. So um, um, the increased costs of capital for climate developing countries are not only eth ethically problematic, but it's also in a way in a rational interest uh, for the, the others. 
to avoid turbulences in the global financial system. So that may even be then um, a harm avoidance approach suitable. At the same time, we are well aware that um, acknowledging responsibility in any way is, uh, is rather toxic in the context of multilateral climate politics. So um, it, looks, it would look easier on paper to apply a harm avoidance approach than it will be in, in political practice. Um, and that's because of the, uh, the, the disconnect between global climate governance and global finance governance. Um, and that does not uh, contradict the observation that finance and anything to do with global finance has become much more important over the past years and decades in the context of global climate governance. Uh, climate finance is a big issue, uh, even a big research issue in its own right by now. Uh, divestment initiatives have been considered a key factor in bringing about the Paris Agreement. Uh, shifting the trillions is the, is the talk in the corridors that, um, um, to sort of deal with the climate crisis. Uh, however, this is still something different than regulating or dealing or adjusting the global um, financial system. So that we can also observe that what we would discuss as climate justice has uh, seen some uptake in multilateral climate governance, even though it is rarely, if ever, referred to as climate justice because of the toxicity of this, of this language in, in the political sphere. Um, but uh, we have seen the establishment of a Warsaw International Mechanism on Climate-Related Loss and Damage. We have explicit acknowledgement of climate-related loss and damage in the Paris Agreement, which was a had been a long time coming and was difficult to negotiate, but it's there now, uh, and in a way acknowledging the injustices. Uh, we have uh, considerably increasing financial transfers through the funding architecture that is provided by the UNFCCC with the Green Climate Fund, um, arguably, arguably being the most important one. The Adaptation Fund, again, politically tricky, but things, things are moving. And there's, of course, the, 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 the pledge by developed countries to mobilize $100 billion per year by 2020 and ratcheting, ratcheting that up further as we move along. So this is all links where, where finance and climate justice issues come together under the UNFCCC. But, um, but still, the UNFCCC is out of its waters to uh, to deal with like climate risk assessment by private uh, rating agencies, and that fix the prices for the cost of capital, and um, um, and uh, to to get access to capital on financial markets is of course a legitimate and sovereign uh, right of developing countries, and also their right to development. Um, so, um, one could argue, even if this comes across as a bit oversimplifying, that UNFCCC uh, more or less represents the supply side of climate finance that is being made available. And um, the, the injustice is also affecting the demand side that least developed countries, climate vulnerable developing countries, uh, do legitimately have. So um, I'm coming uh, to, uh, sort of to the, to the concluding questions. Uh, and we, obviously, we don't have uh, very good answers now, and I hope to um, picking some, some brains here in the discussion. But the, the challenge is to move out of the, the vicious circle of this um, cost of capital um, Injustice and uh, into a into a better direction, and we are wondering how concepts of climate justice may help to this end. Um, uh, in reflection of a very contested multilateral environment, uh, in which approaches to climate justice uh, could actually be conducive to actual prog uh, progress. In the past, we have seen that even the mentioning of concepts such as equity or justice. Uh, is considered a red line in negotiations. So can our concepts actually make a contribution, and if so, how? Um, there's the famous quote from the then head of the US delegation when the Paris Agreement was negotiated, where he 
equipped. If equity is in, we are out, thereby threatening the entire success of, uh, uh, of the compromise that led to the Paris Agreement. And that, mind you, was before Trump. Uh, that was uh, still under the Obama administration. So it is, uh, it is very difficult to infuse justice into the, into the political process. Uh, but it's, of course, necessary and important to move along. Supporting resilience and adaptation is one way of making things less bad. Uh, also, the study that I referred to in the beginning um, um, uh, suggests that what they refer to as social re readiness, which is, in, in, in a way, effective adaptation measures, uh, can help to improve the climate risk assessment so that the cost of capital will not increase as much. But that, that is helpful, that may even be considered reasonable, but it is also obviously still a long way from achieving climate justice. And um, it is with these questions that I, that I want to conclude and to end and look forward to the discussion and then to working further on that, on that paper. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, and thanks for being here. I'm very excited to share with you the work that I've been doing for the past several years. I'm going to shift scales a little bit, both in terms of um, focusing on the context of the United States and then drilling down to a very kind of interactional scale of analysis, interactions between human beings um, in the workplace. So um, I've been doing my work on environmental regulatory agencies in the United States and their environmental justice efforts. So unlike in a lot of other countries in the United States, there's actual formal endorsement and support for the concept of environmental justice. Um, and I'm going to tell you what that's briefly what that has looked like, how um, that has fallen very far short of the principles of the EJ activists who fought for it, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about my contribution to scholarship, trying to sh shine some light on why in agencies' environmental justice efforts in the United States deviate so far from core principles of the EJ movement in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so all of this, including, I mean, this, this is a very long, cumbersome title of this talk, but really all of this is um, will be showcased in my book, From the Inside Out, The Fight for Environmental Justice Within Government Agencies, which is coming out this fall from MIT Press. So I have some flyers in case you're interested. Um, so as you may know, um, in 1993, after years of pressure from EJ activists, the U.S. Uh, uh, um, Environmental Protection Agency created an Office of Environmental Justice. This is the primary uh, environmental regulatory agency at the federal level in the United States. And in 1994, President Bill Clinton signed an executive order on environmental justice, instructing all federal agencies in the U.S. to integrate EJ principles into regulatory practice. In the years since, EPA, um, as I'll refer to it in the rest of my talk, has developed EJ programs. It's provided EJ guidance to other federal agencies, to state agencies, and to tribal agencies. Many of those have adopted their own EJ policies and hired EJ staff. So these are folks who get advice from EJ advocates. Some of them came from the movement themselves, and they propose what I call EJ reforms to regulatory practice. So these are things that would be designed to change the way environmental regulatory agencies regularly do their work in order to reduce environmental inequalities. So inequalities in terms of exposure to environmental harms, but also access to environmental goods like basic um, infrastructure. So some of these EJ reforms include things that have been adopted um, by a number of agencies across the United States, fairly mild things like improved public participation guidelines for staff, advising staff on how to um, communicate more effectively with community members, both to share information from agencies about pending regulatory decisions and ideally to collect more input from community members about those decisions. But more ambitiously, EJ reforms could include things that might directly restrict pollution and other hazards in communities that are already overburdened by those hazards and disproportionately vulnerable to the effects of exposure to them. So that could include things like tightening permit conditions on hazardous facilities in such areas or actually adequately remediating hazards within them. 
So EJ advocates on the outside and the agency's EJ staff have proposed many EJ reforms and fought hard for them for many years. And yet agencies have institutionalized very few of them and none in many cases. So meaning the ways that staff enforce environmental law and regulation has not significantly changed. And this is the case even in those agencies whose leadership has endorsed EJ in principle. It started long before the Trump administration. As Stefan noted, this kind of resistance is long going, as I'll tell you about. And it also characterizes state agencies' progress on environmental justice as well. So this isn't just a problem at the federal level. And it includes states in the United States that are arguably the most progressive in terms of civil rights and environmental politics, including California. So this is a story that transcends changes in political leadership. And my question in doing this work is why? Why have these agencies' progress on environmental justice been so disappointing to EJ activists? Um, and what I found was um, through extensive observations of staff at agency meetings, both public meetings as well as closed door internal meetings, as well as interviews, confidential interviews with staff, almost 100 staff at agencies across the United States, seven state agencies and federal agencies, um, is that EJ reforms to regulatory practice are stymied not only by limited resources, as other scholars have pointed out, not only by um, rollback of regulatory authority and questions about um, conflicting regulatory authority, as other scholars have pointed out. Um, these factors certainly matter, and I don't mean to dismiss them, but what I want to tell you a little bit about today is something that I haven't seen other scholars pay um, really any attention to, which is that EJ reforms to regulatory practice are also stymied by elements of regulatory culture. That well-meaning, dedicated staff, people who are widely regarded as progressive, engage in what are often micro-level interactions that individually may seem innocuous or reasonable, but which together stymie the prospects for reforming regulatory practice in line with EJ principles, and in so doing reinforce a system that has long disproportionately protected whites and relatively wealthy communities in the United States. And in so doing, I'm bringing some lessons from organizational studies, and I'm arguing that EJ scholarship to better explain state practices must follow the lead of organizational scholars like Michael Lipsky and others who have shown that so-called street-level bureaucrats, to use Lipsky's term, exercise discretion in their jobs. And in so doing, they do so in line with their beliefs and their principles about what is right and what is just, and they do so in ways that often mitigate um, justice reforms. So just a quick note on terminology. I refer here to EJ staff. So these are folks who within their agencies have been uh, um, tasked with the work of leading their EJ reform efforts. There are very few of them. In any given agency, there might be one or just a handful. Um, they have almost no authority over anybody else in their agencies. And so they can't make their coworkers adopt environmental justice reforms to their work. Instead, they have to try to convince them that environmental justice is something worthy of their concern and respect and negotiate with them environmental justice reforms that their colleagues are willing to accept and implement. Um, also, most EJ staff are persons of color which is in contrast to the majority of environmental regulatory agency staff in the United States who are white. Um, they have been trained in engineering, law, or science, not in the social sciences. And their attitudes about EJ reforms, as you'll see, vary widely. Everything from a complete lack of familiarity to enthusiasm to outright contempt. So let me illustrate for you what some of these micro-level interactive dynamics are that I observed through interviews and observations of meetings. At almost every agency, not almost, at every single agency in my study, nearly all of the EJ staff who I interviewed described their work now and in the past as fraught. They described facing pushback from coworkers. They described their EJ work as a battle, as a struggle, as pulling teeth, as pushing against a brick wall in every direction in terms of their interactions with their coworkers. I documented what gave EJ staff these impressions. What are the things their colleagues say and do that undermine EJ reforms? And I'm gonna share 
um, two of these with you today. So first um, are this kind of the, the discursive pushback that they faced around EJ that pivoted around this theme about agency effectiveness. So for instance, in meetings about potential EJ reforms, staff challenged the existence and severity of environmental inequalities. As one EJ staff person told me, we spent months just trying to convince some people that inequity existed and was real. Tom, another EJ staff person, told me that his colleagues constantly argue, we are improving things for everybody, and therefore we don't need these EJ reforms that target certain communities. Such narratives, of course, ignore and diminish the highly unequal distribution of environmental hazards and stymie the process, the progress that EJ staff can make. Agency materials reinforce this narrative. Without fail, agency materials highlight agency achievements. They're improvements in terms of air and water quality that they have contributed to in aggregate terms across the nation or across counties or across states, but saying little or usually nothing about persistent environmental inequalities within those spaces. Common sayings within environmental regulatory agencies do similar work. Notably, in my own interactions with environmental regulatory agency staff in this project, as well as previous ones, staff regularly invoke their agency's mission statement, emphasizing we protect public health and the environment. So this is the mission statement of the US EPA. This is almost the same as mission statements for state level agencies across the United States. It's something that staff constantly say and invoke in their conversations about a wide range of topics. Um, but they do so in ways that imply not only aspiration, this is what we aim to achieve, but also fact, as this is what we do achieve. And consistently restating this in such a way establishes that existing or organizational practice is effective. It forecloses conversation about ways that existing practice could be improved, and it frames EJ reforms as unnecessary. Second, in many cases, staff undermine EJ reforms by asserting that they violate the agency's need to be neutral. So bureaucratic neutrality is a key norm within government agencies. Staff invoke it regularly, framing their organization as a neutral actor that uses science to make correct and unbiased decisions and withstands inevitable criticism from all stakeholders. At all organizations in my study, much of the discursive resistance to EJ that I witnessed and was told about focused on the fact that proposed EJ reforms explicitly identify and seek to reduce racial environmental inequalities, among other things, with staff arguing that the race-conscious nature of proposed EJ reforms violates their organization's neutrality. For instance, one EJ staff person told me that when she has proposed EJ reforms, such as increasing outreach in communities of color that are overburdened by environmental hazards, some staff and managers allege that this EJ reform constitutes reverse racism. They say, why should these communities of color get this extra treatment? We need to protect that middle class white community too. Or as Tim, a white manager, told me and emphasized repeatedly in agency-wide EJ committee meetings in which he had volunteered to participate, EJ reforms are unnecessary because we are doing the same thing for people no matter who they are. So Tim's claims matter. Recall, he volunteered to participate in this agency-wide EJ committee. He was often the highest ranking person in the committee meetings and thus functioned as a de facto gatekeeper. Like other managers, he vocally contested EJ staff members' proposals outside these meetings as well. He fought any EJ proposals that were not optional he ignored EJ staff members' recommended EJ practices, and he explicitly told his staff they didn't need to implement them. As contemporary race scholars have shown, these are colorblind racial narratives that are hegemonic throughout US society, and they assert a commitment to abstract liberalist notions of racial equality, while at the same time ignoring the social structures, including the practices of these very agencies that uphold white privilege. This pushback can take very aggressive forms. For instance, um, when Peter and another EJ staff person instituted an EJ training for other staff, some of his coworkers filed a formal civil rights complaint against them, alleging that the training violated their civil rights. 
Notably, although the agency's Office of Civil Rights ultimately rejected the allegation, their investigation took so long that he had to stop the trainings in the meantime while the investigation went on. By the time the investigation had concluded, his management has cha had changed and his new managers decided that wasn't something that they wanted him spending his time on. So the allegation effectively killed the EJ trainings. Um, staff also appeal to bureaucratic neutrality in ways that undermine proposed EJ reforms in also many very subtle ways, and I spell those out in the book. I'd be happy to tell you more about those as well. So EJ reforms offend staff members' identities as neutral public stewards and as effective public stewards. They ask them to do new tasks at a time when agencies' authority and resources are under attack in turn making staff defensive and producing conflict in staff meetings. Staff use colorblind narratives and narratives about agency effectiveness to resolve these tensions. Importantly, in terms of the colorblind narrative, people wield them even when they are well-meaning and intend to be non-racist, and this is an important part of the story. While EJ staff emphasize that not all of their colleagues push back against EJ reforms in these ways, the point is that narratives like colorblindness, because they are hegemonic in US society, are things that anyone can draw on in order to protect a racially unequal status quo from challenge, and many do exactly that, even with the best of intentions. So just to conclude, um, I would argue that strengthening agency EJ reforms will require explicit discussion broadly and within these agencies about how we should measure effectiveness and fairness or neutrality and that notwithstanding the state's role in creating and perpetuating injustice, we have an opportunity here to get people within the state to think critically and differently about what it means to do good work. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you all for, for very interesting and informative presentations. Um, I, I had a question uh, for, for Stefan, and I, I hope this doesn't sound too cynical, uh, but, um, how, how can we be sure that lowering the cost of capital will lead to investment into climate adaptation? Um, and I think of, I mean, actually, I think of the last decade or so um, where, for example, the United States, uh, you know, has, the Fed has left interest rates very, very low. The results of that has been uh, lots of investment, for example, in, in uh, gas exploration and things that are not really adaptive to climate. Um, <laughs> So I, it's just kind of a naive question, and if, there's, uh, if that's thought through in terms of lowering the cost of capital, does that lead to that outcome that we desire? Thank you. Um, there were, was Gareth in the middle, and then um, you on, on, on the far, well, you are uh, far right. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I have also have a question to Stefan, um, because I think you have a nice example of uh, Keynes' claim that we should not be too isolationist when we talk about climate justice, so we should expand our perspective. But I just wondered whether it's a good expand, um, uh, to expand our considerations of justice by just saying, you know, let's apply principles of climate justice of, or of environmental justice to the financial system or whether or, or whether we should rather go for a much broader view and say you know we should also be concerned with global justice with financial justice whatever so really including or integrating more or different debates about justice rather than just saying you know it's an issue of environmental justice that's why we should kind of deal with these principles to solve the problem but rather than expanding and integrating more debates I had a question for, for Mary, actually. Um, I've, um, anyone who works in the UK, particularly in development studies at the moment, has a lot of experience with the SDGs because the UK government is forcing us to basically target all of our research funding applications towards the SDGs. So I really felt the pain, or I felt the pain of trying to target SDGs in grant applications when they're completely contradictory. Um, so I just wondered, is there any way to rescue the SDGs from their internal contradictions? Thanks. Um, there's one more question we'll take here in the front, and then we'll pass it back to us. 
Hi, my name is Leo Bellina. Um, I have a question for Jill, and it's also connected to your talk, uh, Mary. First of all, thank you very much for this brilliant analysis. I, I loved it, and I wish all my colleagues were sitting here. Uh, but of course, they're not. Um, so you, you uh, examined a particular group, uh, the staff in, in those policy agencies. Um, but what I find is it's extremely similar to people invested in sustainability science, uh, especially the Swiss-German school that is also very much linked to certain schools in the US, like uh, Arizona State, et cetera. There's certain schools of sustainability science that have pretty much the exact issues with the discursive pushback, the own identity as actors, neutral scientific actors for the public good that do not need to be concerned with all this other stuff um, because it's all included already. So I would love to hear from you what your experience is um, with people invested in sustainability, sustainability science. I, I know Boulder very well, so there's a lot of those people there. Um, how much pushback do you get uh, touching on those sore points of people in their identities as actors for sustainability and sustainable development goals? Um, because your work actually really touches on those issues with that whole constituency. Do, do you have experience with getting pushback to you personally, to your work, or do they simply ignore uh, the implications? So what, what's your experience? Uh, well, uh, uh, thanks, Ivo. That's that's a comment well taken. Uh, we we may have been getting carried away, starting with the polluted pace principle, but you are right to point that there is also other approaches to justice outside the environmental uh, debate on justice that we may need to uh, consider to find good ways forward. But that was a comment rather than a question. And much appreciated. Um, and the, your co um, comment, um, I think the honest answer to um, do we uh, have any indication that lowering the cost of capital will lead to more climate friendly investment in these countries is no. I mean, that's the point of the sovereign borrowing that the, the countries go to the capital market and get money for what for the development priority that they define themselves. and they may not be the investments that we would like to see as if we care for avoiding climate change. Um, so that's a fair point. But I would like from the justice perspective, I, I can't see how we can follow that. Well, yeah, so they pay a higher climate risk premium. Um, I, it doesn't seem to be OK, right? Um, but uh, it's. Um, it may push us to think further as we as we're trying to come up with solutions or, or responses to this justice problem whether any ways forward that can sort of fix this uh, perversion of the polluter pace principle um, and I'm trying to circumvent the word conditional but can any ways forward be de be designed in a way that it will actually lead to um, decarbonization investments or resilience boosting investments that that might be desirable. But again, the short answer is, yeah, no, you're right. You have a point there. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so part of what I find so important about this work is precisely your point in that the ideologies at work here that feel so dangerous to me. Um, and, I, and I feel very fortunate to have the data to be able to kind of spell out precisely the chain of how these different modes of thinking work their ways through in the workplace and the, the actual material concrete work that they do and very problematic concrete work that they do. Um, that these are ideologies that are pervasive in US society to varying degrees, especially the ideology of colorblindness and to be able to, to talk about it and to show how it plays out within the workplace in these government agencies and to give folks pause about how this might play out within their own lives and their own workplaces um, feels like a fabulous um, sad but fabulous opportunity to have a broader conversation within the broader realm of environmental studies about what it means to be fair and effective in our work. Um, my degree is in environmental studies, so I'm used to hanging out with people who are not particularly keen to think about justice and fairness. Um, I 
um, was made aware that certain faculty in the school where I got my degree at the University of California, Santa Cruz, really resisted the notion of, of um, spending much collective time thinking and talking about justice and fairness. Um, so, it, you know, this is a long ongoing conversation that folks in environmental studies have been having for a long time. Um, I haven't received any direct pushback. Maybe folks have just been super polite about it. I'd like to think that I'm, you know, give, like providing another opportunity for folks to have that conversation. But I have, what I have received is a lot of surprise. And in particular, um, not, I mean, in, mostly from folks in environmental studies or environmental politics departments who seem surprised um, that folks at EPA are not just good people, but that there's some problematic aspects of how that they do their work. And now is a good time to be having this conversation because in the midst of the Trump administration, staff have literally taken to the streets in unprecedented public protest and have resigned in protest of the Trump administration, political actions that we haven't really seen among these bureaucrats historically. Um, and so they're, they've been presented in this very glorified light and their narrative has consistently been, we protect public health and the environment. Um, and so this is just you know, one more contemporary opportunity to be able to say, um, yes, but how well for whom and how, you know, how, in, how insufficiently for, for other groups. Um, thanks, Gareth, for your easy question. <laughs> it's a really important question, and I don't know that I have the answer to it. Um, I wish I did. I think that there's two things that it highlights for me. One of them is within the UK funding frameworks, um, the tendency to focus on having to prove that you are meeting SDGs and development goals in order to get funding to do research that may or may not really be focused on sustainable development per se. Um, and I think that's it is problematic, but it also is allowing people to pick and choose which SDG they say they focus on and claim that they are working on sustainable development when really they're working on something that has to do with some particular small aspect of sustainable development, and it's not really what we would have traditionally thought of as sustainable development research. Um, I don't know that, yeah, I think it's somewhat, somewhat problematic if we're actually trying to fund sustainable development research. However, I don't think um, these frameworks limit research in that way because you can pick and choose, because most development-related research will address one or another of the SDGs. In terms of how do we overcome the contradictions, um, I do think that if we can bring an environmental justice framing to the SDGs, there's a lot of potential to do that. Um, and also to localize the um, reporting on how countries are meeting the SDGs. And, I, and as I mentioned in the, in the talk, these are all being reported at a national level, which has really serious limitations, both in terms of data availability, but also in terms of whether or not you're really detecting any injustices and um, negative implications on the ground for, for local people. And, and so for me, that's one of the things that, that needs to change, that, that local, local level indicators need to be taken into consideration. That um, take into account local people's viewpoints and what they would like sustainable development to look like. And I don't think it does that enough yet. Whether or not that's realistic at the global stage, I'm not so sure, but I think that would go a long way to helping with the situation. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so we have time for another round of questions. One, Rod, anyone else? Um, Stefan, number two. And Doris, number three. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for your presentations. <clears throat> I have a question for Mary. And um, I mean, it's about whether it's a reasonable expectation that the sustainable development goals could be could reflect social or uh, social or environmental justice principles. I mean, is that a reasonable? meter stick to understand whether the SDGs are effective or not. I mean, we did, in that IUFRO issue, we did, we did 
global, we did environmental justice framing on equality in forests, but I don't know about all the other ones, whether that's a reasonable expectation, or I don't know what your assessment is uh, in your thinking about that. My question is also to you, Mary. I uh, just want to make sure that I, I got you right. I'm, I'm not necessarily a, pr a proponent of, of growth, but you were very um, strong in your criticism on um, concluding that including growth in the SDG framework is an outright contradiction to achieving environmental justice. So I, I just want to make sure that I got this right and, and, and ask whether this is not overstretching the growth criticism as many analysis of the various environmental discourses, especially in developing countries, also show that um, growth is considered an important factor in dealing with poverty-related issues and, uh, and, and growth and environmental policies environmental justice being a bigger term, do not necessarily um, exclude each other. But but maybe I, I wasn't getting it right. And then Doris here in the front. Oh, thank you so much for a good presentation. Uh, mine actually is just a comment and sharing some of my experiences. So um, the contradictory nature of the S SDGs and the um, in promoting socioeconomic growth. I think it's very striking to me and taking in the framework of indigenous people and um, I, I'm trying to connect you know, the two presentations, the first one and the, the second one. So uh, the idea, the motto of leaving no one behind and I think that has actually driven a lot of uh, like African economy in terms of developing the big infrastructure in terms of you know, pipelines and roads and railways. And the idea is that they want to include uh, the indigenous communities that were excluded in the mainstream you know, economy in the past. So bringing you know, indigenous people in this development agenda. So if I give you an example, in Kenya, we have the Lapset project, and which is going to connect um, Kenya, South Sudan, and Ethiopia. And so there's huge, um, uh, there's, 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 there's going to be huge projects and development in terms of the roads and railways. And so, so even though this is really good for the indigenous people because they are trying to include them because they were marginalized before, uh, they are themselves sources of injustices as well. And, and, and another example is um, climate change mitigation and adaptation projects measures which are mainly focusing on the private sector investments. So really, if you look at those projects, uh, they are creating injustices because those projects, the private sector projects, they're actually benefiting the private sector. So the local community, one of the, um, the ways to compensate, sorry, to create, uh, to promote justice within the indigenous community is to bring compensation. But compensation, actually, it's only benefiting a few people. And uh, so, for example, if they're, when they're going to build the pipeline between, you know, between Isiolo and, you know, in uh, coastal Kenya, only few people, landowners, like communal, communal land beneficiaries, so only pe few people are going to benefit in these projects. And also, um, climate mitigation measures and adaptation like renewable energy, uh, that is going to benefit creating green jobs, but uh, indigenous people, they are not very well educated. So again, we are focusing on people who are well educated, who are going to get this high you know, level job and employment. So yeah, it's really interesting to me. And I think that is that kind of contradictory, you know, contradictions are something that we need to like explore more and do analysis and see how we can actually um, those gaps and the trade-offs, how do we actually uh, minimize those trade-offs and ensure that there's kind of inclusive, rather than just saying we are going to create like a thousand green jobs, but we don't know who are the losers and who are the, uh, the beneficiaries. Thank you. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, Rod, I think from my perspective, it may not be entirely realistic 
to expect it. Um, but I think that if you want to have development that is truly sustainable, environmental justice issues need to be taken into account. And you can't ha for me, you can't have sustainability without having environmental justice. Um, and so I don't see them as, as being separate things that you can achieve one or the other um, without taking both into consideration. Um, whether or not at the global arena this is, this is a widely held view, I don't necessarily think so. Um, but I think pushing back against the lack of inclusion of environmental justice issues within the SDGs is important. Um, the question about our criticism of, of growth per se. Um, I do take your point I'm, and, and I do think that growth sometimes can be beneficial, especially to alleviating poverty and, and bringing um, some environmental justice benefits. But I think that the problem comes in the framing of the goal in the use of the term economic growth. Um, and I think that if they had said economic development, okay. You know, and I think we can do things to improve environmental justice outcomes and alleviation of poverty and hunger and all of those things without necessarily growing. And I think it's the growth that's the problem. I'm not against economic development and improving, um, you know, incomes, et cetera. I don't think any of us in the co-author list are, but I think you need to think about it. That's, that's sort of more the perspective. It, we should be talking about development instead of growth. Um, just a little comment on your question, um, Doris, um, the, the leaving no behind slogan. And um, in, in, in our case, in Papua New Guinea, there was actually a really interesting example of how this is not just between you know, the UN and local people, but also amongst local people at times. Now, um, when the mine started in 1984, one tribe within the, the, the Min people moved in, moved down the bushes, uh, d down into the area, and, and, and claimed to be um, the landowners. And so they were legally made the landowners and then received um, a, 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 some, some money um, since. Um, but small amounts, but they did. And so now they live in settlements where they have running water and electricity, whereas all their brothers and sisters, other tribes that came after, um, were no longer made legal landowners, and therefore they live in settlements without running water um, and electricity. And that's caused a real rift between them, um, the haves and the have-nots um, within. I think we do have a few more minutes and lunch may or may not yet be ready. So if there's a burning question, um, let's take one or two. Okay, Maria. Repeating the question, yeah, you, uh, uh, Maria, I had difficulties understanding my point about growth. Yeah, um, no, I was I was struck by the by the very explicit um, statement whereby growth and environmental justice are per se a contradiction, and I was just wondering whether this can um, can uphold uh, um, um, empirically. I mean, I, I would agree with um, you know, Mary's notion that sustainability and environmental justice need to go together. There's no um, comprehensive, coherent um, grasp of sustainability if it's, if it's unjust, so I agree. But whether sustainability and growth exclude each other is uh, another, is another debate, and there's a lot of controversy on that. And therefore, I'm not I'm not even necessarily taking sides on that. And I'm, and I'm first and foremost, I'm I'm not an economist, so um, I take note of all kinds of arguments on that. Um, but I was just um, sort of um, yeah challenging this very um, almost absolute statement that growth and justice um, are intrinsically at odds. Uh, looking into what's happening with growth empirically uh, and growth as a means, uh, not not as a growth as an end in itself, 
I'm also, I think there's an, uh, I mean, you're right, there's a lot to worry about, uh, but but still, and this seemed a bit too, too radical, or I put it at what follows from it. I mean, if growth keeps being a reality, do we give up on sustainability and environmental justice or not? I'm not sure I was much clearer now, but that's probably a good debate for lunch. Okay, one question? Oh, yeah, just a quick technical question. Um, EJ staff in these agencies, some of them, that's their whole job, and for some of them, it's just part of their job. So in Colorado, for example, um, when I started the EJ staff person, there was one, and it was only 10% of her job. So she was supposed to spend, what, two hours a week on it. Yeah, so it varies. But at US EPA, there are several dozen across the United States. That's the other end of the spectrum. Okay. Right, well, thank you very much for a very interesting presentations and also challenging questions. Um, have a great lunch break, and uh, we start again in 45 minutes.